Okay. Right, comrades, can I just say first of all that I was in primary school for most of the 1960s and secondary school up to 1975, so I'm not responsible for anything that actually happened. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'd like to start by just uh, uh, scrutinising the notion of 1968. Um, and, and a lot of things get jumbled up in this discussion. 1968 is a year, the decade, the 60s, uh, and sometimes what's called the long 1968, or the long um, 1960s, which is usually seen as extending into the mid 1970s. Okay. Now, um, just looking at it as a year isn't very helpful because lots of things preceded 68 and fed into it, a lot of things came out of it and didn't stop in 1968. And I think one of the no single year really is very helpful to look at it in isolation, even things like 1956 and so on, the genitals and successors. Um, and what tends to happen is people look at 68 purely as a year in itself. And they tend to emphasise students mainly. Okay, look at the general strike in France, maybe what happened in Northern Ireland, but by and large, it's about students. Now, uh, if you look at uh, a longer period, that becomes much more difficult to do. Students are important, but they're not the most central thing about the whole period. So there's another way of looking at it, which is the 60s as a decade, but I'm opposed to any kind of looking at decades. But I mean, we all use this as a kind of shorthand, the 30s, the 50s, and so on, but actually, it doesn't really fit because some things start in the middle of the decade, some, you know, begin towards the end. What people tend to do, and I'm thinking here of Arthur Marwick in particular, there's a book called The 1960s, which starts in 1959 and finishes in 1974. And it's like, come on, if you're going to call it the 60s and make it about the 60s, that's just stretching it to the point where it's meaningless, really. Um, but there's even worse, which is about people, even longer extended periods. In France, particularly, there's a, a way of talking about the 1968 years, which starts with the Algerian War of Independence and ends with the election of Mitterrand in 1982. It's like, well, it's entirely arbitrary. I mean, why not start with the resistance to the Germans in 1945 and finish with the strikes, you know, to defend the public sector in 1985 if you're going to extend it that kind of way? So I think we have to look at what is actually a significant block of time. And what I suggest is that 1968, the long 1968, by which I mean from 1968 to about 1976, um, is what I call an international revolutionary conjuncture, um, which we can see earlier examples of that. I think in 1917 to 1923, and maybe from 1943 to 1949 would be there too, I think, uh, in the 20th century. Some people argue for 1848, 49, to 1905, to 1914. I don't think so, because I think they're not extensive enough. What I'm talking about here is a thing that is international, possibly even global. It's not just that the revolution, the socialist revolution, is possible in general material, you know, conditions are ready for it. That's, that's been the case since about 1900 or earlier. And neither is it an actual revolutionary situation where you have to see state power or not, and it's like, you know, like October 1917 or September to October 1917, but the moment is like short and you've got to make a decision. This is a kind of period where all sorts of possibilities open up of greater intensity in some places than others, some you know, that, that have, you know, more immediate possibilities of fruition, which last for a finite period of time, usually seven or eight years, uh, and, then, you know, and then basically stops you know, or, or begins to fade away or other things begin to happen. So, that's what I think we're talking about when we talk about 68 in this kind of way. One thing is, I'll just say a bit about conjunctures in general, and I've described here, one thing is characteristic of all of them is they don't start with economic crises. Um, 1917 begins with the Russian Revolution, and it's really brought about by the inter-imperialist conflict that generates that, that revolutionary upheaval. Um, 1943, it's, it's the kind of... Uh, well, partly it's Stalingrad and the Battle of Kursk and the defeat of the Germans in Russia, and then the Allied invasion of France, which stimulates the resistance and the beginning of, of, of mass movements against fascism and so on. So none of this got anything to do with economic crisis. Neither is 1968, because it took place not at the end, but towards the end, but not at the end of the, the great post-war boom. In fact, the crisis is, is something that something maybe brings it to an end rather than actually kicks it off. And we can see subsequently 2008 doesn't really lead to a huge immediate revolution of people. So, it's not to do with economic crisis as such, and I think that we need to reject uh, economistic notions that that's what causes revolutionary conjunctures to happen. It isn't. Um, so, just some other general factors. All of these conjunctures involve movements which already exist, but change in the context of the new conjunctural period. So think of civil rights movement in America, which has been going on since the mid-50s, but by the, 60s, the late 60s, it becomes something much more radical, much more militant, you know, black power, black liberation, begins to emerge as a kind of claim rather than simply you know, uh, the, the, the demand for equal rights, much more linked with revolutionary uh, issues. Um, the movements are what Lenin, talking about 1917, calls 
um, heterogeneous, dissimilar, contrary movements. You've lots of different things happening, some which relate to each other, some which don't, but they all, what he says, they merge, they overlap, they kind of pull together. And people, crucially, and the third thing is, people see there's a connection between them. We will understand that the struggle they're taking part in is also met with some other struggle somewhere and is, 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 is involved in it. So, the international aspect of it is that we've seen, you know, historically there have been revolutionary moments in individual countries, or in the case of the Paris Commune, individual cities, um, but they haven't really had the possibility of, of, um, of extending. So, Spain in 1936, maybe Hungary in 56, Bolivia in 1952, they're all important, but they're quite isolated at that time. And if they had been successful, that might have generated a kind of demonstration effect, but actually they don't, we don't know because nothing's ever really succeeded in that kind of individual basis. Certainly the Russian Revolution wasn't isolated. It was isolated ultimately because it wasn't joined by the revolutions, but it was part of a general movement of revolutions happening across Europe at that time. Um, and all of these things are triggered by particular events, as I've suggested there. So, 68, if you look at it uh, in this long term, this kind of extended way, I think if you're looking at what's happening, we have to reject this sort of three worlds view of 68 that sometimes get talked about. I mean, that's the general bourgeois notion of the first, second, third world, but also a kind of orthodox Trotsky's way of looking at the world in which you've got permanent revolution in the third world, political revolution in, in the Stalinist states, and good old fashioned socialist revolution in the first world. Actually, it's much more complicated than that. Um, not least if you don't think that the Stalinist regimes have anything to do with socialism, <laughs> then, then really that, you have to board a political revolution to remove those, those uh, to remove them. Uh, I would rather think of it as a continuum uh, with the imperialist, dominant imperialist powers at one end and the actual colonies, which are still some, uh, in the late 1960s at the other end, and the, the sort of Stalinist regimes occupy back and up and, uh, span in the middle between them. So, it's also important, however, to see that this is a global event, and there's a lot of literature now at 68 which talks about the global 68. And actually it's important, because if you think about France in May, the student uprising is enjoyed by general strike <coughs> workers, but actually similar things happened in Uruguay in Montevideo, in exactly the same time, or about a month later. Similar things happened in Senegal, in Dakar, uh, you know, about the same time as well. And these weren't inspired by France, because they were taking place almost simultaneously, but they involved quite a lot of the same kind of activity the student detonation, the workers joining in, often the students being left to fight after a period of time on their own. So this is clearly a global phenomenon uh, and being produced by similar circumstances even in um, the global south, uh, the third world so it's called at this time. Um, and also a lot of the straightforward class struggle uh, takes place also in what we used to think about as the global south. It's not clear to me, for example, that the Cordobosa in Argentina, a massive working class uprising is any less significant than, say, the Italian hot autumn, which both took place in 69. We tend to think about Italy, but actually and Argentina was just as, in some sense, just as militant and just as significant. So we need to think about this globally. Um, it is important to, f to think, when we're doing that, that the overthrow of capitalism in the West, in the centre of the system, is also crucial. I mean, if it doesn't happen there, it won't happen, right? I mean, whatever important things happen in the third world, it has to be overthrown in the centre. It has to be a foreign America, you know. Um, and so in a sense, some of the books about Harman's book, for example, which I've seen to be lumbered with his title uh, for last thing, is kind of says this, you know, I'm going to talk about the First World because that's, you know, simply where the central struggle is taking place. And, and there's an element of truth in that, that, you know, if it doesn't happen in, in, in Britain and the US and Germany and so on, then actually the system can write, can write it out. So that's, we need to bear in mind that this is a global thing that's happening um, while, while the period lasts. Okay, so it's a context. Well, the context is the post-war boom. Um, the, the most massive expansion of capitalism that we've ever known will never, I think, it's, it will never happen again. And that's a good reason for not treating um, the period from 1948 to 73 as a kind of typical period uh, in capitalist history. I think it's all too often done as people treat it as a kind of model of what capitalism should be like. If it's not, it's completely exceptional uh, and, 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 and extremely um, um, odd in, in the way that actually not just led to increased growth, but actually to increased welfare and so on for the working class in, in, in large parts of the world, including parts of the Stalinist um, world and the, some parts of the world. So, um, two things characteristic about it. Effective full employment uh, in most places uh, and an increase in the social wage, um, the welfare state, housing and so on. Now, I just want to do a bit autobiographical here because there's a tendency to sometimes exaggerate how marvellous things were in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Um, I was born in 57, and first 10 years of my life, I lived in a two-roomed tenement in Aberdeen, privately owned, 
with an outside toilet, an outside washroom in which the woman of the house would go and actually wash their clothes and put them in a mangle to get the water out before they put them up on the line in the green next to the bomb shelter, which was still there from 1944 and 43, in which they managed to keep their tools. We didn't have a phone, we didn't have a fridge, uh, we didn't have an electric cooker, we went to the gas one, we didn't have a bath. If we went to get washed with this one of these aluminium things that you, you know, you'd fall in water and you went to, or you washed in the sink. Um, so, uh, you know, the outside toilet and everything. It's, it, I'm not saying this is a terrible you know, situation, I had a very happy childhood, but if that was where people lived until the late 60s, uh, or slightly beyond that. I mean, in the end, we got a council house because I turned 10 and the council rules were you couldn't sleep in the same room as, your, as, as a sibling, but I had a sister, um, you know, if you were in your teens. And we all four of us slept in the same room for 10 years, right? We had a bunk bed, mum and dad had a double bed next to us. So this is like, people would think that was unthinkable now, but nevertheless, that was kind of typical um, for a lot of the people I knew, um, and most of the people I knew at that time. It was really, in, in some ways, it was actually the very late 60s or into the 70s that people's conditions began to improve really significantly in terms of their, their living conditions and all that stuff. Okay, end of autobiography. So on top of what you've got is a period of growth, people, security, Famously, people leaving a job and going to another one, you know, the next day, it was easy to get a job. And that got a appeal, appeal of confidence that people had, that, you know, well, I don't take any crap because I can, I can go somewhere else and work. Um, so that was one thing, feeding a kind of worker resistance or ability to, to make demands. The other thing was something that we tend to think about in relation to the third world, but it's actually much more general, which is an even combined development. And particularly in this context, having people coming from the countryside into the town, um, coming from rural or peasant or rural communities or very small towns into the factories and into urban life in a way which actually has a kind of detonative effect on them regardless of where you originally came from. This is true in Italy. Um, significant movement of people from the Mezzogiorno uh, south into the Turin, into the car factories. It's also true in France. And it's an important factor, I think, in actually in, in the explosion of 68. Because we tend to think of Russia or the, or the third world as well and even combined development happens, but actually it happens in Europe. Until, until this period really is the last um, period that it happened. It's obviously still happening in China. Um, so that's significant. And finally, the existence of the revolutionary left in a way that was possible to influence events in some way. Don't exaggerate this. Um, most of the groups were still very small in 68, but some of them had thousands of members rather than hundreds. And certainly what had happened in 56, the Hungarian Revolution, the crisis of Stalinism, had enabled the groups to grow to a reasonable size because they had something sensible to say about what had gone wrong in Russia and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so there was the basis of that, and particularly uh, here in America and Germany and France itself. And depending who the groups were, if they were kind of Trots Trotskyists or unorthodox Trotskyists like the International Socialists were in Britain and so on, there was more likely to be a sensible explanation than if you were a Maoist, for example, or, or a Govarist. Um, you know, a peasantry being in short supply in Essex and Illinois for to float amongst uh, and so on. So I mean, the, the, a lot of it, the, the politics depended on who was there, you know, and who had some, some uh, thing to say. But certainly, in a number of countries in Europe, there were, there were reasonably sensible Trotskyist uh, groups um, analysing the situation. Okay, so what were the components then of, of this great explosion? I think I, I want to divide this into two. One group seems to be mainly about the third world and mainly about all the backward areas of Europe. Um, and usually involve once for all kind of transformations of regime or type of state. So first of all, you've got the overthrow of the remaining ancien regimes, uh, most of them in, um, in Asia, sorry, in Africa and the Middle East. So King Erdrus in Libya, Haile Selassie in Ethiopia, good overthrow in military coups, which are basically on the Nasserite model that established in, in Egypt in, in the early 50s. Um, you've got the final struggle against actual, this is the same, part of the same component, I think, the final struggle against actual colonies, uh, most of which, if we leave aside, occupied Palestine, most of which are actually in Africa. Um, so Angola, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, the Portuguese Empire, effectively, in Africa. Um, and that the overthrow of these regimes, mostly by communist-led guerrilla movements. Um, and sort of um, the Middle East, the British presence east of Suez, and uh, what is now the United Arab Emirates, is a kind of preemptive attempt to head off this kind of revolution by, by consolidating those, those and the British pulling out but maintaining a close connection obviously with those, those regimes. So that's one thing. Second thing is the kind of guerrilla struggle against post-independence actual bourgeois regimes which are of course supported by the USA and that's particularly in the China. And so Vietnam, the unification of Vietnam, but also Laos, Cambodia and so on. This, this is the, the, the fulcrum of this kind of struggle. 
It's not just in Indochina, obviously, there's some similar things happening in Latin America, usually to catastrophically no effect. I mean, think of FARC, you know, fights for 40 years in Colombia with absolutely no uh, sense of taking over the country at all and eventually gives up and becomes a, a conventional political party, as it happened recently. But in, in, in China, in a sense, the Americans' intervention opened up the possibility of overturns in Cambodia and Laos, which eventually happened, as well as the unification of the state itself. Third, you have the developmental crisis in the actual Stalinist regimes itself. Like, okay, we've established basic development, uh, industrialization and so on, but what the hell do we do now? This is in China and in Czechoslovakia, particularly. Poland, slightly different, there's something slightly different happening there. But certainly, Czechoslovakia and China, you have the kind of sections of the, the leadership of the, the Stalinist state pulling in the working class or elements of the popular classes into an internal party factional struggle and that get out of hand. Um, you know, particularly in China, the, the Red Guards, you know, the, the idea that well, they make their own demands and they're ruthlessly crushed, of course, by Mao. <laughs> uh, contrary to the fantasies of Western Mao, you know, they're brutally crushed as soon as they attempt to do this. Chinese is actually slightly different because it's a Russian invasion. But nevertheless, you, it's, it's kind of an internal struggle within the, the, the party leading to a kind of greater insurgency from below. Um, fourth, you've got the struggle for democracy in the authoritarian regimes of Southern Europe. Uh, so that's basically Greece, Portugal and Spain. Uh, in most of the cases, these are interwar regimes. And Greece has seesawed back and forth between democracy and various forms of dictatorship, but essentially the same kind of regime, all in the Mediterranean, quite close to each other, a kind of anomaly in Europe, which is supposed to be about democracy, freedom, blah, blah, blah. These are kind of not fascist, but certainly hardcore authoritarian Catholic uh, military regimes. Again, comparable to some of the ones in Latin America. And finally, in this section, you've got the struggle for equal rights against regimes which deny them on ethnic or racial grounds. So that would be the, the, the Catholic presence in Northern Ireland, um, the, the black population of, of South Africa, to a certain extent Rhodesia, um, the Southern States of America, which I mean, obviously there's a general civil rights struggle going on in America, but in the South there's something slightly different, the remnants of Jim Crow and so on, as a kind of way of excluding people in much more systematic kind of ways. So this is all happening, right, at the same time. And all these things are already happening in 68. But again, we'll take on a slightly different significance as we get into the year itself. All of these things could be anti-capitalist, but in the same way they could actually be accommodated to the system in its, in its general kind of ways. Um, assuming, as I am, that the Stalinist regimes are forms of state capitalism. Um, there are some other, turning to the kind of the second lot, and this is, this is much more to do with the uh, the West, although some of the things, students in particular, also happen in the Global South. Um, I'm excluding some things here, like what you might call um, national movements in the developed West, of which, of course, Scotland was one of the first, but Quebec and Catalonia, because they don't really emerge as individual movements at this time. In Catalonia, the, the, the Franco regime is still in power and, and Catalan struggle is still part of the general struggle against Francoism. In Quebec, it's much more part of the working class struggle, the general strikes in, in, the, in, in 1970 and 72, the huge upheavals, which it's not really um, particularly a nationalist movement at this point. Scotland is quite exceptional, but I can't for the life of me see the SNP in 67 as being part of a revolutionary movement to overturn capitalism, even by, uh, even by accident. Um, so I'm not going <laughs> to include that at this point. I mean, the, the, okay, you could say it's a threat to the British state, I think Tom Nier massively exaggerates this at the time. I think subsequently has become a factor of the British state, but that's, that, that's, a, that's a new period. So I'm not going to talk about that too much. Um, so the, the real components, I would say, are these. There's not five. One is the anti-war movement um, against the war in, in Vietnam, and, and by extension, the other parts of Indochina. Um, and of course, that's very much tied to the, the, the outcome of the war. Because the, the war, the anti-war movement, will only go on as long as there's actually a war going on. You know, so it's, it's, it's connected really intimately with, with, with what's happening in, in the China itself. Secondly, and this is where we do come to the question of students. Obviously, students before 1945 have been a small privileged group. Um, really, the sons and daughters of the ruling class being educated to take on that role. After World War II, and as we get into the 60s particularly, there's a, a huge expansion of student numbers. And it's much more about educating white collar, not necessarily middle class, but certainly white collar people in service kind of jobs and technical occupations. Yeah, at the one hand, intellectually developing so they can do these things, but at the same time trying to damp down any possibility of radicalism emerging from what they're actually being taught. Um, so students are a kind of new group. They're not a class, obviously. There's some lunatics trying to argue this at the time. It's everybody looks back at such classics that we all have to view as James Wilcox's two tactics. 
in which we are told that the students can be a sociological inaccessible base, like urban gorillas or, or rural gorillas in, in Cuba, uh, because they're sociologically inaccessible to the police. And this actually didn't work out too well in Greece, as I recall. But you know, there's a kind of <laughs> the nonsense people spoke about students at the time. It's unbelievable. Uh, some people here will remember, but, um, but not a class. But neither are they what Alex Clinicus once called an oppressed group. I think in 1975, because it's like the students aren't, well, I don't think they're oppressed, but they're also not a group, because you don't, you don't, you're not a student forever. I do know some people who try to be students forever, but by and large, you don't stay a student, you go in and do something else, you know, you get a job, which could be a number of different class positions, but it's not, you know, it's, it, you don't carry that with you forever. There might be an argument now about unrepayable student debt, meaning that students have become an oppressed group, but that certainly wasn't the case in 1968, so I think we just have to reject that. Students are a, are a new social formation, a temporary and transient one, who obviously participate in political life, either participate in things like the anti-war movement and various other struggles, or they fight over their own kind of issues, like the size of the classes and what they're being taught, and, you know, and, and racism on campus and things like this. Uh, or even uh, sort of a variant of that would be to protest about things that the university does, for example, cooperating with the arms industry or with the state, so on, that's something too, but they're not something like a class or a present group. It's an additional situation. Um, so, the third group here would be movements against oppression. Um, now, here, the, the black movement in the states is quite specific. And this is partly because in America the black population is much bigger than anywhere else, and it's not something that's post empire, um, people moving in. Um, at the end of World, you know, World War II, there's massive movements, in Britain, particularly in France, from the former imperial areas. It's not that. The people, black people in America have been there since the days of slavery. They're much bigger, it's about 16% of the population, uh, compared to about 2% or 3% of, of the black population in Britain at this time. So the, the black struggle in America is actually quite distinct from any other uh, of, of the struggles of people of colour at this point. Um, the real, I suppose, generalisable movement or struggle against oppression is actually the women's liberation movement which gets going really towards the end of 69 in Britain, uh, earlier than the States. Um, and that's the kind of main one throughout this kind of period. The gay liberation movement obviously t kicks off again at the very end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, but just generally because the numbers involved, it's less, it's less significant than the, the women's movement. But I do think it's important that we don't read back our current um, fixation on identity politics back to this period here. That wasn't the dominant thing. That's why it's the women's liberation movement, not the women's movement, the women's identity movement or something. Um, the fourth, and this is much more amorphous, is the kind of counterculture, um, the underground. Now, here, um, it's important that we don't fall in front of bullshit about generation gaps and such like. Clearly, parents and children always fight with each other and they over different issues, but there seems to me to be a highly a kind of once-for-all shift that takes place in people's attitudes somewhere between the end of the world, Second World War and the mid-60s in terms of sexuality, in relation to drugs, in relation to who you, how you live and the kind of relationships you have. In a way, it's almost like the kind of the superstructure, you know, catching up with the bees. And since we've had this development, you know, prosperity or relative prosperity, in a way, increased, you know, security for white class people, um, that's, as far as that's possible within capitalism, but still really, really conservative social structures. Now it's true in America, obviously, in the USA, like McCarthyism and all that kind of stuff in the 60s. It's also true in, um, in Britain. I mean, I forget who said it was Anthony Howard, but in 1945 was the greatest conservative restoration since, since 1660, meaning that, you know, the, the values that was, even though the welfare state was being created, the actual values that were being were actually really, really um, conservative. Women being kicked out of the factories. The oppression of homosexual of men was extraordinary. It's only now beginning to be fully told by David Nice and the various other people in their histories of the period. The ferocious legal attacks on them, the bans on abortion, the censorship in the theatre, you know, on and on and on. And this only began to be changed in, in the late 60s, often before 68, by the way, through arguments within the ruling class itself um, about, about shifting some of these things. So there's a kind of resistance to that, which feeds in with a kind of two other things. One is bohemia, um, by which I mean the kind of, since the 1840s, there's been a kind of aesthetic revolt against capitalism by people who want to live well, they said they were throwing it. They do hate the bourgeoisie because of its ugliness and kind of ignorance and, and general vulgarity, um, and kind of you know went to live in their own little corner of it. This is obviously a French thing to start with, but it does actually picked up in most other countries. And by the, the, the 60s, you know the Beats in America, you know there's a kind of echo of that in Britain as well, which feeds into hippie when that happens, when it takes off in um, 66, 67, 68. So it's a kind of in a way that that 
merges or, or coexists with the revolutionary left and with some of the, the bigger social movements, but, but sees its role as being slightly separate from it. And if you read, as I've had to do, loads of autobiographies of some of these people <laughs> from the 1960s, you know, they're kind of, yeah, we went the demonstration, but we didn't want the chant, you know, who what you meant, so we chanted hot chocolate, drinking chocolate instead after, after an advertisement, you know, this year really. And uh, this did happen. Uh, you know, there's kind of people just, you know, he wants to be wacky and kind of, you know, and, 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 and a paternal bourgeoisie in, in this kind of way. That's bad enough, but more pernicious than that even is what the company called hip capitalism. You know, you've got hippies, you've got people who want drugs, who want clothes, who want certain kind of records. So I've got to sell it to them. You're going to get it in boots, you know, or, or, any, or, or, or whatever. So, you know, there's a kind of commodity culture that grows up of selling stuff to people, um, uh, which sounds quite you know, radical and underground and so on, but can be a comedy. I was accommodated. Finally, so I think here of two people uh, Bill Graham, the American um, rock band promoter in the States, who put on the Jefferson airplane saying songs about revolution, you know, we are forces of chaos and anarchy, and making lots of money out of it, because the, the, the kids wanted to hear people singing songs about this kind of stuff, so we sold it to them, you know, it's great. Uh, or in this country, uh, and I, oh God, I will loathe this man, but um, there's a photo of Tarek Ali and Vanessa Redgrave at the edge of um, the, the, this, the, this is March 1968 in Grover Square, and the rest of it into the square. And they're standing at the front of the, the gates, and behind them, peeking out over their shoulder, are the adolescent features of Richard Branson. This has captured at least three or four photos. Now, Branson, an absolute swine, but a characteristic capitalist of the, the neoliberal era, was he insincere? Or did he, I assume he went because he agreed with them. You know, he did agree with the, the anti war sentiments, but nevertheless, he became this person who's now so characteristic of it. Not only did he flip Mike Oldfield on us and tubular bells, but he actually. Uh, he did actually use the Sex Pistols, you know, to be fair. But, you know, <laughs> this kind of way in which people went from being, you know, sort of doing this kind of um, the hip capital thing into becoming actual full-blown normal, you know, capitalists owning a railway system and all this kind of stuff. But that kind of was a kind of background to it, in which people pushed for just the kind of dinner way of we want to live the way we want to live um, in ways which merged with these kind of underground um, um, developments. Finally, um, what about the workers? <laughs> I've already suggested that there's a kind of increased confidence people had because they knew they could win in certain demands in terms of wages, conditions, and so on, which you know, certainly hadn't been the case in the 1930s. Um, and also the input of you know, uneven and combined development in parts of, of Europe, even as far west as France. Now, at this point, it has to be remembered, and this is why the, the, the general strike in France was so shocking, was because for years, the great, even great sociologists like C. Ray Mills and this country, John Goldthorpe, were going, there'll never ever be a working class revolution, there won't be any uprisings, or any of the way we remember in the 30s, that was all over. People have accepted the system, of course there'll be struggle over wages, but there won't be any huge upheavals again. The most famous case of this, of course, is the unfortunate Andre Gors, who wrote an article for Socialist Register saying there would never ever be a major political general strike again in France two, two months before the general strike in May 68. Of course, his article came out in August, so he looked really, really stupid, deservedly, for making this kind of, this kind of claim. Because actually, there had been a wave of strikes in France developing from the early 1960s, often in the west of the country, often involving new workers who had just begun to be, to be radicalised and who hadn't been, in a sense, incorporated into reformist kind of trade union activity and so on. And if anyone had been paying attention, you could have seen that was beginning to boulder. So the thing didn't come out of the blue completely. It was just that nobody was really looking at you know, what was happening when these, these um, explosions began to take place. Um, behind all that, there's the beginning of a slowdown in the economy. The real crisis didn't emerge until 1973, but from 66 you begin to see a kind of gradual slowing down of growth and people beginning to pick up and say, well, wait a minute, the things that does, does problems here, which is why you began to get anti-trade union legislation proposed by the Labour government in this, in this country uh, as early as 69 because people saw trouble emerging on the, kind of, on the horizon although it wasn't yet fully clear how that was going to take. Okay, so this is the, all things are all kind of overlapping and merging in land's terms with each other. What triggers the thing um, is really two things. Uh, sometimes it's scared to be three, but I don't think that's two. One of them was the Tet Offensive. The National Operation Front in Vietnam launched an offensive on Chinese New Year at the end of January in uh, 68, uh, and this got as far as Saigon. Now this shattered everybody's, and the American ruling class for a start, they'd been telling everybody they were on the verge of victory, the, the gooks would easily be smashed and so on, and they managed to break through all these lines, got into the capital city of the south, you know, and so everyone, oh my god. It wasn't just the ruling class that was shocked, the left was shocked, as far as I can see, as I said, it was only nine at the time, but from what I can read of the, the biographies and so on, 
people are watching on TV going, oh God, we're winning, you know, because the left is used to kind of heroic defeats. And, 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 so, and, and Tet was a defeat ultimately, but nevertheless, it was like, oh my God, they've managed to do this to the Americans, they've managed to push back what's, what's not possible. And that itself detonated, or at least uh, intensified the, 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 the actual demonstrations, the anti war demonstrations, frankly, in, in Britain and in the States. The second thing, of course, was May itself in France, the student uprising in Paris, uh, and then the general strike, which at that point was the biggest general strike in history, including even more than the, the Russian, the one in Petrograd um, in 1917, that accompanied the Russian Revolution. And, but partly it's because the students had taken place, but because the working class had taken place in this kind of strike in a way that people had been writing off uh, like Gors had um, for, for years and decades beforehand. The third thing that's usually brought in here is Prague, uh, the, the suppression of the Prague Spring in Czechoslovakia. I don't think that was as important. My reading of this is that that had already happened in '56 in terms of Hungary and, and, and Poland and uh, the revolutions about Stalin. So nobody was really going to be shocked anymore that the Stalinists would invade and try and stop the reform movement happening. So you know, obviously it was important, but I don't think it was kind of one of these, you know, let's mobilize because there's some shocking new development taking place at this point. Um, I mean, the, the actual events, and, and those are the three of them, the, the important events of the year. The, the explosion of the civil rights movement in Ireland would be the other one, especially in the British context. Uh, and it drew in a number of influences, I'll see. So, okay, so the, the thing that's important of all is the connections between them. I'll be not 10 minutes. Um, the connections between them. And I want to give one example of how these things connected up. Um, first of all, starting in Africa and the struggle in, particularly in Angola and Mozambique against the Portuguese Empire. So, first of all, um, the victory of what people knew was going to be the victory of the MPLA and the other one, whose name was Luis uh, in, in those two countries. Thank you. Had a feedback into Portugal itself because a group of leftish officers decided that the regime had to be not taken out uh, because of its catastrophic failure um, you know, and, and the disaster that the war in Africa was, was causing. So they have a coup, quite normal in these parts of Europe and or Latin America, but it actually kicks off the Portuguese Revolution, huge popular insurgency coming up from below and so on. So that's one impact. The second is in, in, in um, Africa itself because particularly in Mozambique. There was a kind of impact from the, the, the new, the impending victory there uh, in, in Rhodesia, or as we you know, as Zimbabwe used to be called, where also a guerrilla war was being led by Mugabe at this point. And so that gained a kind of impetus from the fact that there was a victory impending had happened in Angola, Guinea Bissau was about to happen in Mozambique, strengthens the kind of guerrilla struggle there against the, the white regime. Okay, at this point, however, the Americans would normally, this is the third connection, the Americans would normally intervene. Right, because that's what they would do in Latin America and various other places. Um, but uh, there's a problem, and that's Vietnam. Because Vietnam has meant the huge discontent, disaffection amongst the troops, including particularly the black troops. So Henry Kissinger goes, right, we'll send some troops <laughs> to Mozambique to fight the liberation forces there. A person who's actually Colin Powell uh, said to him, so Henry, are you going to send them with guns, loaded guns or not? And Kissinger, of course, thinking, well, but we are, because they'll probably turn the guns on our officers before they turn them on the people who are supposed to be fighting. No troops are sent from America to Mozambique or any part of Africa at this point. The Americans then go, this is, part of, this is because of the resistance to the war from within the army itself. The Americans then go, okay, sort of get, we'll get the South Africans to go into the dirty forest in, in, in terms of these, these states. So the South African troops go in. And they are met by intense resistance by the black forces there, and also by troops in Cuba who come in to, to, to support them. South Africa is defeated, which again is a third, a fourth effect, because the defeat of the South African troops in South Africa itself leads to, or at least contributes towards the great insurgency in the townships and in, in Soweto and the resistance to the imposition of Afrikaans, uh, which is happening at this time. So the, these connections, I mean, that's one example, but how you can see how these things are all knotted together, and actually real effects, not just kind of ideological effects, but actual real impacts in how politics is spanning out in, in a global way um, across, across the, the, the Third World and, and the First. Or others we could think about. Um, I mentioned Ireland, Northern Ireland. Uh, here there's two influences. One is the civil rights movement in the States, but the other is the rebellion in France. And Bernadette Devlin, as she was then, if you read her autobiography, uh, The Price of My Soul, came out in 69, and Pan Books, if anyone wants to get it in the books, I think. Um, she's, she's saying, oh yeah, we, we learn a lot from these things. And people from France came over to Belfast to speak to us about our street fighting techniques because we were really excited by the, <laughs> the film of us fighting the British Army or fighting the, the police in Northern Ireland and wanted to know how we were so good at it. We would learn all this stuff. 
Um, she also says at one point, oh God, I was so sick hearing about the Sorbonne. And so we went to hear about the Divis Flats, we went to hear about the bloody Sorbonne, you know, but this was kind of uh, weird, which we all are, okay, this is our thing, we don't just want to be, you know, feel that we're kind of pulled in behind events elsewhere, or we're simply a repetition of those things. But clearly we're influenced by this. Uh, or one final thing, um, in America, at Lordstown Car Plant in Ohio, great strike wave in, in, in 73, um, by people who'd been influenced by the counterculture, wearing those kind of clothes, feeling the resistance to alienation and so on, uh, and go on strike, not for wages, but against the speed of the line, against the, kind of the, 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 the way in which they're forced to work harder and faster, in terms of actually making the cars themselves. One of the leading shop stewards there described this as, as, as the, the woodstock of the working man. <laughs> Uh, perhaps women were involved as well, but nevertheless, you know, the idea that, you know, that this is the kind of, that, that there's a connection with the counterculture, and, and this is what we are, we are expressing in this factory. However, it wasn't all positive influences. I've already mentioned Maoist fantasies, and France particularly, people seem to have a kind of bizarre alternative universe view of what was happening in China. Um, you know, uh, the bore no relation to what was actually going on in China, but, but has this kind of fantasized, you know, version of it. But at least most Maoists, didn't actually try and set up guerrilla warfare in, 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 you know, in Glasgow, or whatever may have been the possibilities of this. They, you know, they, they set up quasi-Stalinist kind of parties, as you'd expect. Bavarist kind of uh, politics have played a much more disastrous effect, as far as I can see. If you think about the Weathermen, the States, or a number of the kind of armed groups that set up in, in Germany uh, and Italy, um, disastrously, you know, in every respect. And not just in Europe, Govarism was catastrophic in Latin America. I mean, no, nobody was able to reproduce the Cuban experience, even assume that was a positive thing. You know, and, and Guevara died trying to, to impose it in situations where it simply wasn't appropriate. And where the ruling class had learned what happened in Cuba. I mean, they're idiots. I mean, they do actually learn from history, even if we don't. You know, they, 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 they saw how they were able to take over in, in, in Cuba and be sure that wasn't going to happen again. Um, so this you know, uh, there were problematic connections being made as well as useful ones. So the end of what happened. Um, here, there were actual defeats. I mean, I think it's important. Um, I, looking back through my, my records, I came across, I think it was the second issue of the Socialist Review from 1978, and there's loads of commemorative articles in it about uh, 68 from David Witchery and, and Tanik Al and, and Chris Harmon. And what's was interesting, Harmon says at this point, of course, the struggle's still going on. The thing that started in 68 is still happening now. There's only been one defeat, and that's Chile. And I thought, whoa, you know, that's like, I, I, I remember reading that at the time, but I, I hadn't really clocked it, but it's like, really, you're saying this, 1978? I mean, he changed his position quite soon after that. But, I mean, there had been quite a lot of defeats. It wasn't just Chile. I mean, Czechoslovakia, obviously, 68. Um, Salon, the field insurrection in 71, or Sri Lanka, as it's now called. Um, the Chilean um, coup, the Uruguayan coup, the Argentinian coup, the Thai coup, most of these in 76 right at the very end, you know, so there's about half a dozen quite serious defeats, but okay, that's not the world and it's not everywhere. But um, beyond that, you have what I sometimes call the catastrophe of victory, and I'm thinking here particularly about Cambodia, uh, Cambodia, and kind of, you know, if that's socialism, uh, why, are we, why are we fighting for this? You know, if it's a genocidal worker state, presumably, um, you know, killing people and so on, and then the war between Vietnam and Cambodia, then China and Vietnam, and so on, and it's, you know, the, the idea that, that, that we'd struggled and supported this, and this is what it ended up like. You know, the, you know, the, the ethnic cleansing of Chinese in Vietnam and the, the boat people and so on. So that had an impact, I think, uh, an effect. Um, however, the, the real problem, I suppose, is, is that it was possible to have victory over the immediate issue that was confronting people without that necessarily leading to socialist conclusions. And I think that a lot of people on the left, and I think this is also to the IS at the time, had the assumption it was permanent revolution or nothing, it was defeat or, or victory, you know, there was no sort of compromise possible. But actually, in Greece, in Portugal, in Spain, the regimes fell, and you didn't have a revolution. What you had was a kind of, you know, a, a, usually a socialist party, untested and previously, and quite new, coming into the, the breach and actually promising the forums, and, and, and of course people were well, okay, let's give it a try. Um, and, you know, that happened, not just in those three countries, but elsewhere. Britain. I mean, the, well, the few actual victories, you know, the overthrow of the regime or a government, I suppose, um, one was in Pakistan in 69, although that then led to the breakup of the country and formation of Bangladesh and so on, but one was in Britain in 74. I mean, you know, he gets brought down by the miners' strike in 74, uh, and the miners' strike still going on during the election that he called, uh, and effectively that's what, what leads to his defeat. <coughs> they were stepping into the breach as always, and you know, you, and you get a kind of winding down. At this point, the 
the economic crisis has returned and in a sense it's about uh, okay, what do we do? Workers are going, well, what do we do now we're in crisis? It was okay when we were in the boom, but can we still carry on fighting in the same kind of way now we're in this, this, this situation? And therefore it makes it easier to listen to people and say, leave it to us, we'll make reforms, we'll do this, um, uh, or, or let's compromise the government and so on. And that wasn't just in Britain, that was Italy, France and a number of places as well. Um, finally, I suppose, if there isn't a working class solution to the problem, there will be a ruling class solution. One of the events I haven't mentioned up till now, of course, was Enoch Powell's Rivers of Blood speech in um, 1968. And we tend to think about that in relation to simply the racism and Powell's um, position. But actually, Powell, an interesting character in terms of ruling class uh, ideology, because he was one of the first people to put together the kind of package that we thought of later as Thatcherism, in the sense of quite of conservative or reactionary positions on race, particularly but also the family, gays and all the rest of it, but the markets, what we now see of as neoliberalism, the kind of market domination, and that was his position. And it, it, although he expressed it in such a way, because it was so tied up with the racial question that even the Tories wouldn't touch it at that time, but the economic aspects of that, in a sense, built into Thatcherism, and the response to the events of 68 and so on, and the crisis that emerged, was a ruling class one that said, okay, let's try and take control of this. You know, they didn't know what they were doing, really, between 68 and 75 and thereabouts. So it wasn't a coherent kind of ruling class response from about the middle of the decade there was. And that's the response that we now think of as neoliberalism. Okay, just to conclude, why, why haven't we had a similar period since? Uh, I think it's a really important question that the left has to ask itself. Um, we can see there's been regional upheavals like uh, 1989 in Eastern Europe, obviously, or 2011 in the Arab Spring. We've seen moments where you've seen almost global kind of like the, the another world as possible stuff from 1999 onwards, mm -hmm. merging into the um, the anti-war movement in Iraq. And by the way, the demonstrations against the Iraq war were far bigger than the, the anti-Vietnam war ones. I mean, it's clear about that. You know, the, the, the biggest one in London was, was far larger than the biggest one. Uh, so there wasn't, there wasn't social forces there, you know, but it somehow it never connected into a kind of totally global kind of thing. The nearest we came to that was probably around about 2011, while well, the Arab Spring is going on, you've got Occupy, you've got the movement of the squares, and it's like the Scottish referendum, which I see as part of that movement. But there's kind of separate and distinct, nobody really feels the part of the kind of global movement at that time. So it hasn't happened, and I think we need to ask why. Uh, and also I think we need to say, well, what would it be like? What would the components of a similar type of process be now? And I, I'm throwing this open to, the, to you. I mean, I think things like the environment and then catastrophic climate change would be one issue. Migration in a number of ways would be another. Um, resistance to populist right-wing and so on. I mean, we can think of a number of things, how they might connect up, but clearly that will be different. So, the process I'm saying is we should remember 1968 and we should celebrate and all the rest of it, but our real task is supposed to think about how we would set the conditions of what we can do to make sure something like this happens again, when recognising it when it happens.